This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural lesson today comes from the book of Numbers, just a couple of verses there to give context. Numbers chapter 34, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites and say to them, When you enter Canaan, the land that will be allotted to you as an inheritance is to have these boundaries. It's to have these boundaries. And then it goes on to delineate the various boundaries for the various tribes of Israel. And so I want to talk today from the subject of simply respect boundaries. Respect boundaries. It was God himself who established boundaries. Remember when the earth was chaotic, the main reason that it was chaotic is because there were no boundaries. So the first thing that God did as he came into a chaotic world, and, and I want you to understand this very carefully, remember that in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the earth was without form because it had no boundaries. And boundaries are the things that give us a form. And so I want you to realize God was there and God had created something. The earth was there, but it was without boundaries, without form, and it was void. It is to show that God can be there in your life. The Bible says that the Spirit of God hovered over. He was there, God was there, and it was still chaotic. Can you imagine that God can still be in your family, your family is still chaotic? I mean, the earth was there, and it was, darkness was there, and it was still chaotic even though God was there. And the Spirit of God was just hovering. I think that he was waiting on a word to be able to bring order. And maybe, maybe while God is there, I mean, he, he respects his word so much that maybe he's waiting on something to be established because when God stepped out in creation, he began to create distinction, borders between night and day, borders between the waters above and the waters below. So it, he made a distinction between the heavens and the earth. And then he made a distinction in borders with dry land and then the waters because they were all just running together and it was chaotic and so all of the water from the atmosphere that was down on the earth and, and everything was all a, a, a big mess and even God was there though. But he was waiting on something. And it was a word that then brought order to chaos. Sometimes all you need is one word from God to bring order to your chaos. And let me just remind you of this, that there are some problems that God will place in your life that are God-sized problems, and no man, no matter how advanced our technology, no matter how advanced our medicine and, and, uh, and all of our screenings and all of that, there are some issues and problems in this world that are specifically designed to be a God-sized problem. And maybe it just needs some delineation where there are borders. We, you can imagine how much chaos happens in our world because people are living without boundaries. But God gave them. He says, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to give an allotment here to the various tribes. I'm going to give you a lot. Now, the word lot actually came to mean an assignment. When you received a lot in life, it was your assignment. You had something to do. I mean, an inheritance was a lot. It was a lot. And so when you inherit something, there comes responsibility. 
That means that you, you're the trustee of what you have inherited. So when you inherit a piece of property, I mean, yes, it is a blessing, but now you got to get it painted. You got to replace the, the roof and windows and, and have the yard maintained. It's, 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 it is an inheritance, but it is an assignment all at the same time. Whenever you receive an inheritance, God is giving you an assignment. So when the children of Israel, when all of those different tribes were being given their territories, their boundaries, God was saying, this is your area of responsibility. Can you imagine how much chaos happens on jobs? Because you're in your lane and you know and somebody else is butting in your lane trying to tell you how to do, do your job. And, and if, if it is somebody who's in a higher position, you know, there's a conversation that you've got in the back of your mind saying, stay in your stay in your lane. You, 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 you're just simply saying, why don't you respect the boundaries here? Respect the boundaries. And I, I want you to realize this. Blessings come with boundaries. Blessings come with boundaries. Blessings come with boundaries. Positions come with boundaries. You get a position, it comes with boundaries. Property comes with boundaries. If you got some property, they're, they're boundary lines. Money comes with boundaries. Money comes with boundaries. Our personhood comes with boundaries. That's why if a person gets within a certain a number of feet in proximity to you, we will say, get out of my face, and we really mean get out of my space because you have crossed over a boundary line of comfort with me. So there are boundary lines, and freedom comes with boundaries. You, you are not free to just do whatever you want to do, particularly if your actions, your behavior begin to impose on someone else. So freedom uh, has to be contained within boundaries. And so everything that God does, he's, he's a God of order, and he's going to give some boundaries because you can't do all of anything that you really want to do. You have to have boundaries. Freedom comes with boundaries, and that's why wars are fought and lives are lost when we do not respect boundaries. You'd be surprised about that. I mean, look at what Russia is doing to Ukraine. There's a, there's a boundary there, and they say, we're coming over there anyway. So whenever you have an issue, but wars are fought, lives are lost because people don't respect boundaries. Marriages are destroyed, and, and trust is broken when we do not respect boundaries. Health is destroyed when we do not respect boundaries. You cannot eat all you want to eat. Save some for later. <laughs> Sleep depravity is experienced when we don't respect the boundaries of going to bed on time. And boundaries, they keep babies from falling down the steps and from getting into the cabinets to be able to consume something poisonous. They need boundaries. Boundaries help to keep us safe. I mean, free speech has boundaries. I mean, I know that you've got free speech, but listen, we're the people of God. It really burdens my heart when I see Christian people, so-called Christian people, on social media having no boundaries with their freedom of speech. I mean, just because you can say what you want to say doesn't mean that you ought to say it. Some things are best left unsaid. They're best left unsaid. Do I have any Bible for it? Absolutely. Have you read Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 23? Notice what that word of the Lord says. Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you'll stay out of trouble. <laughs> oh, I just love the plainness of the Scripture. There are some people... I want to just tell them, just shut your mouth. Don't you realize we can see you and hear you? Just because you have freedom of speech doesn't mean you ought to be free to just give voice to every lewd thought that crosses your mind. Have a filter. Have some boundaries with what comes out of your mouth. And please understand this. Boundaries are not punishment. Boundaries are protection. Boundaries are not punishment, they are for your protection. 
I mean, whenever I visit the old world and, and I go there and I see walled cities, it's not that they were trying to lock the people in, they were trying to keep enemies out. They were creating a barrier, a boundary to be able to keep the people safe. So we can't just do whatever we want to do, when we want to do, to whomever we want to do it, just because we have blessings and opportunities that God has given to us, because we have no right to, be, to abuse other people just because we might have power. We don't have a right to disrespect the rights and the privileges and the blessings that other people have just because we might have position. We have no right to steal from people. I mean, we have no right to belittle people who don't have the capacity to be able to defend themselves. Just because you could do something doesn't mean that you should do it. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Creating boundaries creates power. It actually creates power because boundaries, hear this carefully, boundaries create clarity. And clarity gives focus. And focus produces power. Boundaries create clarity. People don't have clarity because they don't have boundaries. Clarity gives us focus, and focus gives us power. Have you ever seen just a garden hose or water hose and and uh, when you have just the water hose and you turn the water on and the water pours out and it just pours out and cascades down right where it comes out. But if you ever get a nozzle and put it on the end of the water hose, what the no nozzle does, the nozzle creates a boundary so that not all of the water can get through at one time. So it shuts off part of it to allow pressure to build up behind it and the nozzle focuses so that my water doesn't just cascade out right where I'm standing. I can now, if I've got a nozzle on there, I can shoot my water 50 feet from here. It gives me power to be able to project because of the focus. Boundaries will create clarity. Clarity creates focus and focus creates power. And we need to be able to put a nozzle on our hose <laughs> so that what comes out of us can be focused with power. It has the perspicacity of an eagle to where it's not just spewing out, just saying stuff and it sits there. If you really want to go far, focus what you're doing. Focus your energy. Focus your gift. I know you're multi-talented, and you, you know, you become a, a jack of all trade and a master of none. Focus on one thing. When the Bible says that a man's gift makes room for him. I know you're multi-gifted, but there is one dominant gift that is in your life that will make room for you. There's one dominant gift that is your moneymaker. Focus on your moneymaker. There are a lot of things that I could do, but I'm going to do what I know is my call. I'm going to do what I know that I'm gifted to be able to do. I'm going to do what, what God has given me. I'm going to flow in my gift. That's where my strength is. That's where my power is. That's where the most people get blessed. And if I focus on that, I can go farther. If I'm focused on that gift, then to just be pouring out a lot of stuff in mediocrity right here at my feet. And so if you lack focus, you lack power. So when God wants to give you power, he will narrow you down. He will nozzle you. It, will, it feels restrictive for a moment, but there's a pressure of something cooking on the inside of you. And God is saying, why do you keep lifting the, the top off of the crock pot? And let me just say this to you. When it comes to the will of God, you can't speed God's will up for your life. You cannot speed up God's process. Are you listening? You cannot speed up process. But your crazy disobedience can slow it down. You have no capacity to speed up what God is doing in your life. But you can slow it down. So when you just focus on what God has called you to do, you're in the fastest lane of acceleration. God's already got you on the fastest path. And he's taking you through process on purpose 
so that he can build something of strength and power in your life. God's trying to get you ready for something that will just bless not only you, but it will bless the world through you. And I'm excited about it. And so I would say this for, to, to you. As it relates to our respecting boundaries, I would say this, create some rules for yourself. Create some rules for yourself. Decide your limits. Decide your limits. Yeah, you could do this, you could do that, you could do the other, but decide your limits. Don't spread yourself too thin. Decide your limits. Gluttony is food without limits. Alcoholism is alcohol without any limits. We get into addictions when we don't have limits. And so, if you don't have some rules for yourself, if you don't make some boundaries for your own life, how much is too much? How far is too far? And then you won't even realize that you've gone too far until you've gone too far. I remember the first time that I, that I ever experienced sunburn. I didn't know that anybody in my complexion could sunburn. I had never used any kind of stuff on my skin to, you know, and you know, I, I, I married Redbone. <laughs> We're on our honeymoon and, and uh, she's lying out there on the beach and, uh, you know, with all of her uh, protective stuff on and I'm, and I'm, I'm looking at her saying, mine is built in, baby. <laughs> Check this out. And I'm just laying out there trying to keep up with her. And little did I know, I mean, you, 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 I didn't realize that I was burning until I was burnt. <laughs> I just put it that way. And then you don't even want anything to touch you after that. I mean, I, I mean, I wonder why I couldn't feel it happening to me. And that's the same way that sin does us. You're under the heat of it, and you're laying out there, and it's feeling good, and you think that you are protected, and you are roasting and cooking from the inside out. You don't even realize what's happening to you until all of a sudden you get up the next day, and you can barely move. It's only because we didn't respect boundaries that, that there's a limit, and had I just restricted myself to 10 or 15 minutes, I would have been okay. But when you bask for hours, and I thought that I had it built in, I bet I haven't done it again. You burn me once, you know, shame on you, you know, but it has not happened again. And let me say this, sometimes you can sin by doing nothing. Here's the word of the Lord, James chapter 4, verse 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Oh, my God. Yep, that's in the Bible. It is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. You ever seen old people, yeah, you know, yeah, I ought to get on from here and put something on the stove and get a, a yeah, I ought to. I know I shouldn't eat all of this. It is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's called the sin of omission. Sweet sinners commit that. You know, they, but they say, Lord, I would never do this. But what are you leaving undone that you ought to do? And Jesus zeroed in on things, and he says, you know what, you tithe of anise and cumin and all of the mint and all of this stuff? He said, but you have left the weightier matters of the law undone, of justice and mercy. You left that undone, and sometimes that's the sin of omission and not merely the sin of commission. And so discernment is key, because you know, it's wrong to stay where you do not belong. And it's just as wrong to go where you do not belong. And you've got to have the discernment of the Holy Spirit operating on the inside of you so that you know what to do. Discernment is key. And let me give you this principle, that trust is restricted to whatever is within the boundary of truth. We can only trust what is ultimately based on truth. If it's not based on truth, you can't trust it. Trust is restricted 
to whatever is within the boundary of truth. We can only trust what is ultimately based on truth. And this is exactly why Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. refused to submit himself to what he called unjust laws. He was referring to laws that were not based on truth. So he called that civil disobedience because God had a higher law. It's not that he was disobeying the law of the land, it's that he was submitting to the higher law of love that comes from God, the higher law of justice that comes from God, of loving justice and mercy and truth. And he was submitting to a higher law that caused him to have to now go into civil disobedience. The, the late Congressman John Lewis uh, participated in the same kind of thing, and that's why he called it good trouble. And sometimes when you just do what's right, and, and not what's expedient. And, and please understand that not everything that is legal is right. And this is why he had to engage in good trouble because there were some things that were legal, but they were not right because they were not based on truth. And so I will say this, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost are the result of walking within the boundaries of God's word and his will for your life. If you want to experience that righteousness, that peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, they are the result of walking within the boundaries of God's Word and God's will for your life. So you have to distinguish between your, your boundaries, what's a boundary, and then understand that a limitation is a little different than a boundary. Don't, don't allow your limitations to become your boundary. And let me see if I can distinguish that a little bit for you. A boundary is something that shows the end of something and hence the beginning of something different. So when you see a boundary, you know, uh, most of our states are bound by some kind of a river, a mountain or something. A boundary is something that shows the end of something and hence the beginning of something different. When you, when you go to California and you go there from the, from the beach, you, 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 you hit it toward the west, there's the Pacific Ocean over there. The, it's the largest of all of the oceans. So you're on land, and then when you get, when, when, the, when the sand runs out, that's a boundary. That's a boundary, and that boundary is now called the Pacific Ocean. And so it's the end of one thing, it's the beginning of something different. But, but now here's a limitation. A limitation is a restriction that does not allow you to proceed. That's a limitation. That's a limitation. When, when there's a glass ceiling in an organization, in a company, in the corporate world, and you can only go so high. That's a glass, see, that's a limitation. It's a restriction that just says, do not, do not proceed from here. And sometimes that's just to keep you uh, locked into where you are. So you have to distinguish the difference between those. Limitations don't tell you how, uh, how far you can go. Limitations actually show you how short you stop. That's a limitation. And your limitation could be due to your, your own mindset your own feeling of inadequacy, your own low self-esteem. And so I would say to you this, that some limitations are designed to be broken. Some limitation, not all of them, you know. I mean, the speed limit is a limitation. The speed limit is for our safety. So I'm not saying just go out here, you know, and just act like you're on the Autobahn. Uh, there are limitations for a reason, but some limitations are designed to be broken. Let, let me just show you, you know, because the Bible says that we are born of an incorruptible seed of the Word of God. It's an incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word. And the whole principle of heaven is built on the principle of a seed. And let me just show you this, this meme that shows you the power of a seed that was planted. Look at that. And a rock was in its way, but the tree said, I'm coming through. When there's a seed in you, even when the world will try to put obstacles to box you in and to say that you can only go this far, you can only earn this kind of money. But listen, when the seed is in you, the seed begins to reproduce and this has got to, I mean, it is, it is a natural thing. It is a nature thing. You can put cement over it and if you leave it and come back in, 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 a, in a couple of hundred years, you will watch nature overtake the finest of castles. It'll break up through asphalt, break through concrete, break through marble. And I'm telling you, when there is a seed on the inside of you, whatever is buried is coming back up. 
it is coming back up. So if you ever hide that Word of God in your heart, it's coming back up. When God has planted a seed of destiny on the inside of you, it is coming back up. Even when others try to put restrictions and limitations on your life, when God has said, this is the, the you know, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Even if time looks like it's dragging and it's not coming so well, and if there's some things that you haven't done up to a certain age, I'm telling you that you are in a position now where God would let you get a certain age and be able to do the thing that he called you to do, not in your younger years, but in your latter years, so that the glory of God could be seen in a brand new dimension. My God, I'm here to declare to you that some of you are about to get your next win. I just heard, I heard, I just heard the word of the Lord. Let me tell you what he just said. I heard him say five words in my spirit. He didn't whisper this, he shouted it. I heard him say, God is on the rise. Oh, God is on the rise. I'm going to prophesy it. God is on the rise. I don't care what the devil is doing. I heard in the spirit, God is on the rise. God is on the rise. Say it to somebody. God is on the rise. Prophesy to your neighbor. God is on the rise. 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 When God arises, darkness begins to back up. Healings begin to come. Forgiveness begins to flood over people. Restoration comes between relationships. Miracles happen when God is on the rise. Promises come into manifestation. When God is on the rise, there's an acceleration toward the north. God is on the rise. When sin doth abound, there does the grace of God much more about God is on the rise. God is on the rise. God is on the rise. God is. Oh, God is. Some of you are about to experience incredible change in your life. And I heard the Lord say these two things. Some of your change will happen because your mind opens. And the other changes that will happen, happen because your heart is broken. Either God will open your mind or the situations of life will break your heart, but it will shift change into your life. When your mind opens by the Word of God, when your mind opens by a new divine concept that God begins to bring you into the know of, your change can come because your mind opens or because your heart breaks. And when you break, you're no longer the same person. When your mind opens and you've grown and you've developed and you see new revelation, you're no longer the same person. So whether it comes by openness of the mind or brokenness of the soul, you're no longer the same. And sometimes when God really wants to maximize the change that he's making, he will open your mind and break you all at the same time. And you'll see God in some brand new dimensions. I'm just here to tell you today, I'm telling you, God is on the rise. God is on the rise. It may look like the devil is winning. God is on the rise. It's not what it looks like. God is on the rise. I, I want you to hear that as a jingle that goes over into your soul. God is on the rise. This is a prophetic word of the Lord. God is on the rise. I heard him. I am sure of it. God is on the rise. You watch what God will do next. You watch what God will do next. You just watch. You watch what God will do. And I encourage you, in the words of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9, I encourage you to stay alert and watch out for your great enemy, the devil. 
because he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That means he can't devour everybody. So he's looking for somebody that he can. He's looking for someone that he can devour. He can't devour everybody. Stand firm against him. Stand firm against him. Stand firm against him and strong in your faith. Stand strong against him as the devil is trying to move and take more territory in our culture. Stand firm against him. Stand firm against him. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. And remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. But you'd be surprised how many fights happen as a decoy. The devil would love to get us to be able to fight each other so that we can't fight the real enemy. You know, whenever there's a flood in the land, a flood is the result of water that has disrespected the boundary of the banks of the river. And so whenever a border is overrun, damage comes. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will lift up a standard. It's time to get out the sandbags. And can I even say this to you, that some of your minds have wondered whether or not you're in faith at all because you've been dealing with doubt in your own soul. And it is not that because doubt is present that faith is not. There are sometimes two sides of the same coin. It's an interesting dynamic that whoever say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. It didn't say doubt in the head. The head is designed by God to doubt for your protection. It's a, it's a function of discernment. It's designed to doubt things so that you're not so gullible. It's time for us now. We are living in a day now where you can't be gullible. And let me just tell you this, there are people that are being duped by artificial intelligence, but if you got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you and somebody's calling you something down in your Noah, down on the inside of you says something's not right about that, that looks like them, it sounds like them, but something's not right about that, down in my spirit. You see, God uses doubt as, a, as the curiosity that he nurtures to walk you through a portal of greater understanding in faith. Lee Strobel is a great example of that. He was an extremely accomplished writer for the Chicago Tribune. And one day his wife struts in the house and she says, honey, I've given my heart to Jesus. I am now a follower of Jesus Christ. And somehow he was frustrated by her decision believing that it was hogwash. And so he set out to use his investigative probing skills to expose the fallacies of the central themes of Christianity. And a strange thing happened that as he was questioning the validity of the scriptures, he began to discover that their answer was leading him to faith. And one question after another, what started as doubt culminated in faith. And he wound up writing an incredible book called The Case for Christ that has helped millions of other people wrestle with their questions with God and led them to faith, but it all started with doubt. And even God can take your doubt and on the flip side of that, it's the faith that God had to unveil to you to show you that I was in control of all of this the whole time. While you couldn't see what was on the other side, that if you just trust me when you can't trace me. If you've got questions, God says, I've got answers, and I will lead you into an understanding of my will and my word, and your life will be changed forever. I encourage you today.
to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in the boundaries that you are to sometimes impose on yourself. And then those boundaries that we as parents, because one of the greatest disservices that we could ever deal and give to our children is to allow them to live their life without boundaries. It can destroy them. And parents, as the guardians and as the protectors of their children, have to create healthy boundaries for them so that they can live and thrive. And listen, this is about being kind, not necessarily about being nice. And let me help you to understand the difference between the two. You may go out someplace in public and a person who's being nice to you while you might have something, a little friend in your left nostril. <laughs> the nice person will smile at you and, and act as though nothing is there because they don't want to embarrass you. And so they won't say anything because they're being nice. But the kind person will say, you got a little friend that's, you know, <laughs> you might want to check this out in your left nostril. It's kind, it's not nice, but it is kind because they're thinking about you to keep you from further embarrassment. And so not all kindness comes off as nice because it confronts us with an uncomfortable truth. And it's a way of just saying, you might want to, this would be a great time for a selfie. <laughs> And you do know why we call them selfies. It's because the word narcissism was too difficult for most people to pronounce. <laughs> but as parents, one of the greatest gifts that we can give to our children is to give them boundaries and to help show them where their gifts are so they can focus and have a power. When you know people, you understand what they're good at and what their God call is and what's naturally in their DNA as a natural proclivity. When you're a parent, you have to notice little things while they are little because it's a strength in them that can grow into their powerhouse and their money maker in their life. And it doesn't come because you give them carte blanche. It's because you will stand there and help to actually restrict them so that they develop in that area. When you want to develop a particular muscle, you isolate it and you do exercises that will isolate your bicep or your tricep or your latissimus dorsi. Uh, you know, it's, it's whatever you want to build, isolate it. Create a, a boundary. And there are some times that God will put you in something where you thought that you were actually put in isolation, but God actually calls it separation. And there is always, without exception, separation before there is elevation. So when God's getting ready to take your life to another level, you're going to have to come apart from your routine. And he's going to create a boundary in your life. And you're going to feel all alone and and uh, there are going to be some things that you're going through. There's something that you can tell a good friend about. There's something that you can only talk to you and Jesus about. <laughs> and in that isolation, you'll find a divine elevation that God brings you through the openness of your mind and the brokenness of your heart into a brand new person. I pray you got something out of the word of the Lord today. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb. Bow your heads. I just want this to be a time of introspection for you right now, right where you are. To just pray and ask God, Lord, show me what needs to be restricted in my life. Father, show me what you're doing. I want to be open to you. I want to be open to the new thing that you're doing in my life. Why is that? Because old keys don't open new doors and God says I'm gonna take you some places you've never been before you're at an age and stage in your life right now you've never been before and some of this stuff is scary 
But this is a place where God says, trust me in this, in this moment, in this hour. Trust me in this new season. Trust me in this new season. Trust me in this new season. Because some old things are going to fall off of you. But some new things, though it looks like it goes into dormancy, but God says, I've got something budding on the inside of you. I'm going to bud some new things through you. Come spring, you're going to spring forth, but it doesn't happen until you fall back. Your next season is going to come through a something that looks like dormancy, but you cannot rush God's process. You cannot rush it. You can only submit to it and say, God, work in me what needs to be worked by your own spirit. And this is the time right now, whether there are sins of omission or sins of commission, that you'll talk to Jesus. And you'll ask him to give you courage, not merely to be nice, but to be kind. Kind enough to tell people the truth. Kind enough to be able to do what is right by being kind, but yet firm, standing strong in resistance of the enemy who's coming after your household. And I pray that you will ask God that he will give you discernment, discernment, discernment in your eyes, your heart, and your mind to know the timing of the Lord, the seasons of the Lord, and to know what, what you ought to do in this season. May he show you the boundaries that you need better tabs on to be able to take you, prepare you to where God is, is bringing you. Take a moment just to talk to him right now and just know in the midst of this that God is on the rise. God is on the rise. God is on the rise. It's going to be different this time. God is on the rise. God is on the rise. He's bringing some of you up out of the dung hill. You've been down in the dumps, but God is on the rise. You've been wondering when God is on the rise. That's something rising on the periphery. God is on the rise. God is on the rise. It might look like the size of a man's hands, but God is on the rise. You better prepare your chariot because it's about to flood. God's glory, Shepregobunskia, Fachengurimbasia is about to be revealed in brand new dimensions. I pray that it is your prayer, Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory, Lord. Show me your glory. There's glory in every story. Don't you dare leave this place until you have discovered and unveiled the glory of God. We were formed for his glory. May God show you the glory in that that is contaminating or polluting it and diluting it. Talk to him because God is on the rise. God is on the rise. God is on the rise. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.